three. I trust an only child. I was born at P. My parents came from Q. It was from them I received, together with the treponema pallidum, the huge nose whose remains you have before you. They were severe with me, but just. For the least peccadillo, my father beat me till I bled with his solid razor strop. But he never failed to notify my mother that she might dress my wounds with tincture of iodine or permanganate of potash. Here lies, no doubt, the explanation of my unconfiding character and general surliness. Unfitted for the pursuit of knowledge, I was taken away from school at the age of thirteen and placed with farmers nearby. Heaven, as they put it, having denied them offspring of their own, they fell back on me with very natural virulence. And when my parents perished, in a providential railway smash, they adopted me with all the forms and observances required by the law. But no less feeble of body than of mind, I was for them a constant source of disappointment. To follow the plough, ply the scythe, flounder in the mangle wurzels, and so on, were labours so far beyond my strength that I literally collapse whenever forced to undertake them. Even as shepherd, cowherd, goatherd, pigherd, it was in vain I strained every nerve. I could never give satisfaction. For the animals strayed, unnoticed by me, into the neighbouring properties, and there ate their belly full of vegetables, fruit, and flowers. I pass over in silence the combats between rutting males when I fled in terror to take shelter in the nearest outhouse. Add to this that the flock or herd, because of my inability to count beyond ten, seldom came home at full muster, and with this too I was deservedly reproached. The only branches in which I may boast of having, if not excelled, at least succeeded, were the slaughter of little lambs, calves, kids, and porklings, and the emasculation of little bullocks, rams, billy goats, and piglets, on condition, of course, they were still unspoiled, all innocence and trustingness. It was therefore to these specialities I confined myself from the age of fifteen. I have still at home some charming little, well, comparatively little, rams' testes dating from that happy time. In the fowl yard, too, I was a terror of accuracy and elegance. I had a way of smothering geese that was the admiration and envy of all. Oh, I know you were listening with only half an ear, and that half unwilling, but that is nothing to me. For my life is behind me, and my only pleasure left, to summon up, out loud, the good old days happily gone forever. At the age of twenty, or possibly nineteen, having been awkward enough to fecundate a milkmaid, I ran away under cover of night, for I was closely watched. I improved this occasion by setting light to the barns, granaries, and stables, but the flames were scarcely under way when they were doused by a downfall none could have foreseen, so starry was the sky at the moment of ignition. That was fifty years ago. Feels like five hundred. He brandished his stick and brought it down with a thump on the seat, which emitted instantaneously a cloud of fine ephemeral dust. Five hundred, he bellowed. The train slowed down. Mercier and Camier exchanged a look. The train stopped. Woe is us, said Mercier. We're in the slow and easy. The train moved on. We might have a lit, said Mercier. Now it's too late. Next stop, said the old man, you will light with me. This puts a fresh complexion on it, said Mercier. Butcher's boy, said the old man, poulterer's boy, knacker's boy, undertaker's man, sexton. One corpse on top of another. There's my life for you. Gab was my salvation. Every day a little more, a little better. The truth is I had that too in my bleeding blood. My father having sprung, with what alacrity you may imagine, from the loins of a parish priest, it was common knowledge. I infested the outlying whore shops and saloons. Comrades, I said, having never learnt to write. Comrades, Homer tells us, Iliad, Book 3, lines 85 and following, in what consists happiness here below, that is to say, happiness. Oh, I gave it to them. Potapompos groton evohe, like that, hot and strong, picked up at night school. 
He burst into a wild, raucous laugh. Free night school for glimmer, thirsty wrecks. Potapompos, scroton never, hey, the soft cock and buckets of the hard. Step out of here, I said, with a stout heart, and your bollocks in your boots, and come again tomorrow. Tell the missus to go chase apes in hell. There were delicate moments. Then up I'd get, covered with blood and my rags in ribbons, and Adam again. Brats, the off-scourings of fornication, and God Almighty, a cheap scent in a jakes. I clean myself up and crash their weddings, funerals, balls, wakes, and christenings. They made me welcome another ten years, and I'd be popular. I let them have it on the lot. Hymen, Vaseline, the evil day from dawn to dark. Till I came in from the farm, or better still, the farms, for there were two. The creatures, bless their hearts, they loved me to the end. A good job for me they did, for my snout was starting to crumble. People love you less when your snout starts to crumble. The train slowed down. Mercier and Camier drew in their legs to let him pass. The train stopped. Not alighting, said the old man. You're right. Only the damned alight here. He wore gaiters, a yellow block hat and a rusty frock coat reaching down to his knees. He lowered himself stiffly to the platform, turned, slammed the door and raised towards them his hideous face. The train moved on. Adieu, adieu, cried Mr. Madden. They loved me to the end. They loved... Mercier, whose back was to the engine, saw him as he stood there, dead to the passengers hastening towards the exit, bowed down his head till it lay on his hands at rest on the knob of his stick. With what relief the eyes from this clutter to the empty sky. With what relief back again. A fresh complexion? said Mercier, a totally fresh complexion. Camier wiped the pain with the cuff of his sleeve, caught between the palm and four crooked fingers. It's the end, said Mercier. That just about... He paused for thought. That just about finishes me, he said. Visibility nil, said Camier. You remain strangely calm, said Mercier. Am I right in thinking you took advantage of my condition to substitute this hearse for the express we agreed on? Camier mumbled something about burnt bridges and indecent haste. I knew it, said Mercier. I've been shamefully abused. I'd throw myself out of the window if I wasn't afraid I might sprain my ankle. I'll explain everything, said Camier. You'll explain nothing, said Mercier. You took advantage of my weakness to cod me. I was getting on an express when, in fact... His face fell apart. More readily than Mercier's, few faces fell apart. Words fail me, he said, to disguise what I feel. But your weakness, it was precisely, said Camier, that prompted this little subterfuge. Explain yourself, said Mercier. Seeing the state you were in, said Camier, it was imperative to go, and yet, at the same time, stay. You are cheap said Mercier. We'll get down at the next stop, said Camier, and consider how to proceed. If we see fit to go on, we'll go on. We'll have lost two hours. What are two hours? I wouldn't like to say, said Mercier. If, on the other hand, said Camier, we see fitter to return to town. To town, cried Mercier. To town, said Camier. To town we shall return. But we have just come from town, said Mercier. And now you speak of returning there. When we left town, said Camier, it was necessary to leave town. So we very properly left it. But we are not children, and necessity has her whims. If having elected to drive us forth, she now elects to drive us back, shall we balk? I trust not. The only necessity I know, said Mercier, is to get away from that hell as fast and as far as possible. That remains to be seen, said Camier. Never trust the wind that swells your sails. It is always obsolete. Mercier controlled himself. A third and last possibility, said Camier, since none are to be neglected, is that we form the heroic resolution to stay where we are, in which case I have all we need. A village, just one long street, everything lined up in a row. Dwellings, shops, bars, the two stations, 
railway and petrol, the two churches, graveyard and so on. A straight. Take the raincoat, said Camier. Pah, I won't melt, said Mercier. They entered an inn. Wrong address, said the man. This is Messrs. Clapp and Sons, wholesale fruit and vegetable supplies. And what leads you to suppose, said Camier, that we have not business with Father Clapp or one of his waste products? They regain the street. Is this an inn, said Camier, or is it the fish market? This time the man made way, all of the flutter. Come in, gentlemen, he said. Step right in. It's not the Savoy, but it's, how shall I say? He took their measure with a quick, furtive look. How shall I say, he said. Say it, said Camier, and put us out of our pain. It's snug, said the man. There is no other word. Patrick, he cried. But there was another word, for he added, in a tone of tentative complicity, whatever that sounds like, it's gemütlich. He takes us for globetrotters, said Mercier. Ah, said the man, rubbing his hands. Physiognomies, pronouncing, as was his right, the G, have no secrets for me. It's not every day that I have the honour, he hesitated, that... I have the honour, he said. Patrick! Speaking for myself, said Mercier, I am happy to meet you at last. You have been haunting me this long time. Ah, said the man. Yes, sir, said Mercier. You who appear to me most often on a threshold or at a window. Behind you torrents of light and joy which should normally annihilate your features but do not. You smile. Presumably you do not see me, across the alley from where you stand and plunged in deepest shadow. I too smile and pass on. Do you see me in my dreams, Mr. Gull? Let me relieve you, said the man. In any case, it is a happiness to meet you again, said Mercier, in such happier circumstances. Relieve us of what, said Camier. Why, said the man, of your coats, your hats, Uh, how shall I say, Patrick? But will you look at us, said Camier, do we appear to be hatted? Are we wearing gloves without our knowledge? Come, sir. A porter for our trunks, said Mercier. What are you waiting for? Patrick, cried the man. Vengeance cried Mercier, taking a step forward. It was a fair day. The saloon was crowded with farmers, cattle dealers and the like. The beasts proper were far on their way already, straggling along the miry backland roads to the cries of the herds. Some would come at night to their familiar buyers, others to others they knew not of. Bringing up the rear, behind the sodden news, a train of clattering carts, The herds held their pricks through the stuff of their pockets. Mercier propped his elbows on the bar. Camier, on the contrary, leaned his back against it. They guzzle with their hats on, he said. Where is he now, said Mercier. By the door, said Camier, observing us without appearing to do so. Can one see his teeth, said Mercier. His mouth is hidden behind his hand, said Camier. I do not ask if his mouth is hidden, said Mercier. I ask if one can see his teeth. One cannot see his teeth from here, said Camier, owing to the hand that hides them. What are we doing here, said Mercier. First eat, said Camier. Barman, what are your tidbits today? The barman rattled off a list. Mine will be a button fish salad, said Camier, with Dutch dressing. Not on today, said the barman. Then make it a hopper sandwich, said Camier. Just finish the last, said the barman. He had heard it was better to humour them. You keep a civil tongue in your head, said Mercier. He turned to Camier. What kind of a kip is this, he said. What kind of a trip is this? At this point, the journey of Mercier and Camier seemed likely indeed to founder. That it did not was doubtless due to Camier. 
mirror of magnanimity and ingenuity. Mercier, he said, leave it to me. Do something for God's sake, said Mercier, do something. Why must I always be the one to lead the way? Call your employer, said Camier. The barman seemed reluctant. Call him, my good fellow, said Mercier. Call him when you're told. Make the little sound he can tell from every other, and would not fail to hear even in a howling gale, or the little beck that is lost on all but him, and would bring him running though the heavens were to fall. But he whom Mercier had called Mr. Gall was already by their side. Have I the honour of addressing the proprietor? said Camier. I am the manager, said the manager, since he was the manager. It appears there is no more hopper, said Mercier. You have a curious way of managing for a manager. What have you done with your teeth? Is this what you call gemutlich? The manager wore the air of one in thought. He had no taste for trouble. The extremities of his drooping grey moustache seemed bent on meeting. The barman watched him closely. Mercier was struck by the scant grey strands, fine as a babe's, trained forward with pitiable coquetry from the back of the head across the crown. Mr. Gall had never appeared to him thus, but always erect and smiling and radiant. Ah, well, said Mercier, no more about it. Such shortage is understandable, after all. Would you have room by any chance, said Camier, where my friend might take a moment's rest? He is dropping with fatigue. He leaned towards the manager and whispered in his ear. His mother, said the manager. My mother, is it, said Mercier. She died perpetrating me, the slut, rather than meet my eye. What's all this, he said to Camier. Have you no respect for my family? I could manage a room, said the manager, but of course. A moment's rest, said Camier. He is out on his feet. Come on, nightmare pal, said Mercier. You can't refuse me that. Of course, at the full day rate, said the manager. On an upper floor, as far as possible, said Mercier, where I can throw myself out of the window without misgiving, should occasion arise. You'll stick by him, said the manager. To the last, said Camier. Patrick, cried the manager. Where is Patrick, he said to the barman. Out sick, said the barman. What do you mean, out sick? said the manager. I saw him last night. I even thought I saw him just now. Out sick, said the barman. No hope, they say. Sinking fast. How aggravating, said the manager. What's the matter with him? I do not know, said the barman. (sighs) And why was I not informed, said the manager. We must have thought you knew, said the barman. And who says it's serious, said the manager. It's a rumour going the rounds, said the barman. And where is he, said the manager. At home or... A pox on your Patrick, cried Mercier. Do you want to finish me? Show the gentleman up, said the manager. Take their order and hurry back. Six, said the barman, or seven, said the manager, as the gentlemen prefer. He watched them go. He poured himself a glass and tossed it off. Ah, Mr. Graves, he said, good day. What are you taking? Nice pear, said Mr. Graves. Oh, that's nothing, said the manager. I'm used to it. And where, might I ask, did you get used to it? said Mr. Graves in his incipient pastoral patriarch's thick bass. Not among us, I vow. Where I got used to it, said the manager. 
He closed his eyes the better to see what was still in spite of all a little dear to him. Among my masters, he said. I am happy to hear you say so, said Mr. Graves. I wish you good day. The manager capped this. His weary gaze strayed over the saloon where the honorable yokels were making to depart. Mr. Graves had given the signal. They would not be slow to follow an example of such moment. The barman reported back. Mr. Gass did not at once reply, intent on the scene as it faded and gave way before his open eyes to a little grey medieval square where silent shapes, muffled up to the eyes, passed slowly with laboured tread in the deep snow. They took both, said the barman. Mr. Gass turned towards him. They ordered a bottle of malt, said the barman. Have they settled, said Mr. Gast. Yes, said the barman. Nothing else matters, said Mr. Gast. I don't like the look of them at all, said the barman. Particular the long hank with the beard. The little fat one I wouldn't mind so much. You keep out of it, said Mr. Gast. He went and stood by the door to take civil leave of his customers, whose departure, in a body, was now clearly imminent. Most of them climbed aboard old high-flung fords. Others dispersed through the village in search of bargains. Others gathered talking in the rain, which did not seem to incommode them. They were perhaps so pleased, who knows, for professional reasons, to see it fall, that they were pleased to feel it fall, wetting them through. Soon they would be on their several ways, scattered along the muddy roads, shadowy already in the last gleams of niggard day. Each hastens towards his little kingdom, his waiting wife, his beasts snugly stalled, his dogs listening for the coming of their lord. Mr. Gast returned to the saloon. Have you served them? he said. Yes, said the barman. They made no remark said Mr. Gast. Only not to be disturbed, said the barman. Where is Patrick, said Mr. Gast. At home or in hospital? I think he's at home, said the barman, but I wouldn't vouch for it. You don't know a great deal, said Mr. Gast. I keep my mind on my work, said the barman. He fixed Mr. Gast in the eye on my duties and prerogatives, he said. You couldn't do better, said Mr. Gast. That way, greatness lies. He went to the door. If I'm wanted, he said, I've gone out and won't be long. He went out, sure enough, and sure enough, was not long. Dead, he said. The barman wiped his hands in haste and crossed himself. His last words, said Mr. Gast, before yielding up the ghost, were unintelligible. Not so his second last, a gem of their kind, namely, a pint, for the love of Christ, a pint. What ailed him exactly, said the barman. How many days had he coming to him, said Mr. Gast. He drew on Saturday like the rest, said the barman. Negligible so, said Mr. Gast. I'll send a sheaf. A good pal as ever was, said the barman. Mr. Gast shrugged his shoulders. Where is Teresa? he said. Don't tell me she's been taken too. Teresa? he cried. In the toilet, said the barman. Nothing escapes you, said Mr. Gast. Coming, cried Teresa. A buxom wench appeared, a big tray under her arm and a clout in her hand. Look at this sty, said Mr. Gast. A man entered the saloon. He wore a cap, a trench coat, all tabs, flaps, pockets, and leather buttons, riding breeches and mountaineering boots. His still brawny back was bowed beneath a knapsack filled to bursting, and he held a huge stick in his hand. He lurched across the saloon, dragging noisily his hobnailed soles. Some are best limbed at first sight those liable to vanish and never reappear. My parquet, said Mr. Guest. 
water, said Mr. Conair, the name without delay. Mr. Gast did not budge, nor did the barman. Had Mr. Gast budged, then doubtless the barman too had budged, but Mr. Gast not budging, the barman did not budge either. Water first, said Mr. Conair. Then floods of liquor. Thanks again. Thanks enough. He shared his sack with convulsive contortions of shoulders and loins. Gin, he said. He took off his cap and shook it violently in all directions. Then he put it back on his shining sugar loaf. You have before you, gentlemen, he said, a man. Make the most of it. I have footed it from the very core of the metropolitan gas chamber without rest or pause except twice to... He looked about him, saw Teresa, already seen, but now with ostentation, leaned across the bar and finished his phrase in a murmur. He looked from Mr. Goss to George, as the barman now is called, from George to Mr. Gast, as though to make sure his words had done their work. Then drawing himself up, he declared in ringing tones, Little and often, little and often, and gently, gently, that's what I've come to. He leered at Teresa and broke into a strident laugh. Where is your convenience, he said, adding, Convenience, they call it a convenience. Mr. Gast described the way that led to it. What complications, said Mr. Conner. Always the same abominable well-bred latency. In Frankfurt, when you get off the train, what is the first thing you see? In gigantic letters of fire, a single word. Yeah. Gin. Neat, said Mr. Gast. Mr. Conair stepped back and struck an attitude. What age would you say I was? he said. He rotated slowly. Speak up, he said. Don't spare me. Mr. Gast named a figure. Damnation, said Mr. Conner. Got it in one. Tis the baldness is deceptive, said Mr. Gast. Not another word, said Mr. Conner. In the yard, did I hear you say? At the back, on the left, said Mr. Gast. And to win from here to there, said Mr. Conner. Mr. Gast renewed his directions. Lest I be taken short, said Mr. Conner. On his way out, he paused for a brush with Teresa. Hello, sweetie, he said. Teresa eyed him. Sir, she said. What loveliness, said Mr. Conner. At the door he turned. And graciousness, he said. What graciousness? Mr. Gast and George exchanged a look. Get out your slate, said Mr. Gast. His next words were for Teresa. You couldn't be a little more endearing, he said. The old dirt, said Teresa. No one is asking you to wallow on the floor, said Mr. Gast. He began to pace up and down, then halted, his mind made up. Stop what you're doing, he said, and collect yourselves. I shall now treat of the guest, that wild, lovable beast. A shame that Patrick is not here to hear me. He threw back his head, clasped his hands behind him, and treated of the guest. Even as he spoke, he saw a little window opening on an empty place, a moor unbroken save for a single track, where no shade ever falls, winding out of sight its gentle alternate curves. Not a breath stirs the pale grey air. In the far distance here and there, the seam of earth and sky exudes a sun-flooded beyond. It seems an autumn afternoon, late November, say. The little black mass, slowly approaching, gradually takes shape, a tilted wagon drawn by a black horse, without effort, saunteringly. The wagoner walks ahead, flourishing his whip. He wears a heavy greatcoat, light in colour, its skirts trailing on the ground. It may even be he is happy, for he sings as he goes, 
in snatches. Now and then he turns, no doubt to look inside. As he draws near, he seems young. He lifts his head and smiles. That will be all for today, said Mr. Gast. Impregnate yourselves with these considerations. They are the fruit of an eternity of public fawning and private snarls. I make you a present of them. If I'm wanted, I'm out. Call me at six as usual. There's something in what he says, said George. There's men all over for you, said Teresa. No more ideal than a monkey. Mr. Canaire reappeared, enchanted to have got it over so fast. I had my work cut out, he said. But I did it. I did it. He shivered. Nice North Pole you have here, he said. What will you take? Jump at the chance. I feel the other hell calling me back. George jumped. Your health, sir, he said. Pledge it. Pledge it, said Mr. Canaire. None deserves it more. And Rosebud here, he said, would she deign to clink with us? She's married, said George, and mother of three. Fie upon you, cried Mr. Canaire. How can one say such things? You're being stood a port, said George. Teresa moved behind the bar. When I think what it means said Mr. Canaire. The torn flesh, the pretty crutch in tatters, the screams, the blood, the glare, the afterbirth. He put his hand before his eyes. The afterbirth. He groaned. All the best, said Teresa. Drink, drink, said Mr. Canaire. Pay no heed to me. What an abomination. What an abomination. He took away his hand and saw them smiling at him, as at a child. Forgive me, he said. When I think of women, I think of maidens. I can't help it. They have no hairs. They pee. Not, neither do they cack. Mention it not, said George. I took you for a maiden, said Mr. Canaire. I give you my oath, no flattery intended. On the buxom side, I grant you, nice and plump, plenty of bounce, a bosom in a thousand, a bottom in a million, thighs. He broke off. No good, he said. Not a stir out of him. Teresa went back to her work. I now come to the object of my visit said Mr. Conner. Would you happen to know of a man by the name of Camier? No, said George. Strange, said Mr. Conner, seeing I was to meet him here, this very place, this very afternoon. Here's his card. George read, F. X. Camier, private investigator, soul of discretion. New one on me, said George. Small and fat, said Mr. Canaire. Red face, scant hair, four chins, protruding paunch, bandy legs, beady pig eyes. There's a couple above, said George. Showed up there a short time back. What's the other like, said Mr. Canaire. A big bony hank with a beard, said George. Hardly able to stand. Wicked expression. That's him, cried Mr. Conair. Those are them. Slip up now and give him the word. Tell him Mr. Conair is waiting in the lounge. Conair. They left word not to be disturbed, said George. They turn on you like a shot, I tell you. Listen, said Mr. Conair. George listened. Well, I don't mind trying, he said. He went out, and a moment later came back. They're snoring, he said. Rouse them, said Mr. Canaire. The bottle is empty, said George. 
And there they are. What bottle? said Mr. Kinnear. They ordered a bottle of malt in the room, said George. Oh, the hogs, said Mr. Kinnear. There they are, stretched out side by side in their clothes on the floor, said George, snoring hand in hand. Oh, the hogs, said Mr. Kinnear.